much she will tell us about the regulatory role a royalty norm in the same way in this session. Right on. Okay. Looking forward. Sorry, I don't, I don't think if the mic is now on. Yeah, many thanks to the organizers for the invitation and giving us the opportunity to present this work here. So, what we are interested in is regulatory roles of RNA in viruses. And we've spoken before about the regulatory roles in assembly. You heard us talk a lot about packaging signal mediated assembly, and Faza has already introduced this nicely to you. This is the idea that in the genome there are sequence elements that, when presented in the context of RNA secondary elements, then they act together to promote the formation of virus, virus capsids, and they both provide efficient assembly and selective packaging. We have worked as a wider team between the, team, the Leeds team and the York team on identifying those packaging signals in a wide array of viruses. So there's an example from hepatitis B virus, Tartini Cash Patel is somewhere here, then Becca and, and the team has worked on HPV1 and Enterovirus E. But for the sake of today, what we really would like to address is do those roles finish this assembly or do they actually extend across the entire viral life cycle? And how widespread is this mechanism in nature? Is it only confined to viruses or is it really a fundamental mechanism? Does it actually also occur in other systems? And finally, and that's what I was touching briefly upon because the recorded talk is can we use that in order to um, enhance the packaging of therapeutic cargo. So I'd like to draw your attention to two posters that are conveniently located next to each other. This is Becker's poster and Sam's poster. These two have been heavily involved in the work I'm talking about, so please go and talk to them as well after this talk. Right, so we jointly developed between the two teams a new technique to probe the structures of RNAs in viruses. There are a lot of techniques already out there, but they use chemical probing, and it is not clear when you use chemical probing whether you change the RNA secondary structure inside. And we are really interested over the whole life cycle how these elements behave, so we do not want to interfere with them. For this reason, the technique that we are using is using synchrotron radiation that excites the water, and that then has the effect that it creates the mix, it creates modifications in the viral sugars in elements of the RNA that are not protected. By protected, we mean either an RNA-RNA interaction or an RNA-protein interaction. So any single standard RNA portions can be mixed, can be sort of detected in this way, but if other things are um, protected, we call them protected. So I obviously won't get you through this in a 15-minute talk. This is just a little effort for Sam, who's done amazing work. He's sitting there, the gentleman there. <laughs> yeah, please talk to him. He's developed that whole suite of analysis tools. There was previous work by Sarah Woodson on the use of similar techniques for the ribosome, but we have different challenges when it's packaged in a container because the radiation is obviously shielded there, but so we needed a lot of other um, techniques for that. So this gives you an idea, and this is actually really running away from me here a bit. So um, that is our model system for today. You heard us talk about bacteriophage MS2 in the past. We understand so much about the system that it's actually a good study system to roll out this idea of looking at entire life cycles. So it probably doesn't need much of an introduction, right? If you're in doubt, we have tried to paint it on a balloon, so have fun with that balloon in the, in the corner there if you want to know more. But basically, we have two types of dimers here that that form the capsules. So there is one set of dimers around the five foot axis and then on the two foot axis uh, 30 copies of the other one. We also have this kind of rendering here of a TR stem loop. This is the major packaging signal. And when it binds to a symmetric dimer, it creates the asymmetric form. Now, here you see the typical output that we are reading out, and it's around this TR region in the genome, so we're only showing you a little part here. So what we are reading out is basically these, um, these, uh, how much protection we have in uh, special positions. So we get data sets that tell us, in terms of these peaks, how 
much how likely it is that we have a nick in a certain position. Um, and then we can create distance maps between the virion and the transcript to see, I don't know why this is going forward. <laughs> so, um, a distance map between the virion and the transcript, and can see where are changes for the transcript is actually non packaged RNA and then the packaged RNA. And what you can see already here that there are some positions where you don't have very much variations, but other positions really vary a lot. As we know from structure coding, what we do in our team is then to use these energy predictions, these coding predictions, and what you have there is what's called Boltzmann factors that take those data in with the scaling factor and an offset. It's not a priori clear what they should be, so you use elements that you're sure about from biochemistry that they would exist to benchmark against and look which parameters work best with these uh, elements here. So if we want to use TR, that's not a good um, element to use because that's in both the transcript and in the uh, virion, but what we chosen is its neighbor, which is another packaging site, which changes conformation of the packaging. So that's a very good descriptor. So what we're doing is these landscapes of M and B different combinations, and we see which one is best picking up this change that we know exists. And then we roll that combination out across the entire data set to make our structure predictions. So here is then the outcome of what we're getting. What we found is very interesting compared with the Quarian data from Hong's lab that identified 15 packaging sites. So this is uh, from their lab biodial paper um, where we have these 15 packaging sites that have been identified. But with our method, we can actually show that there are 31 that have the signatures of being in contact, so the loop portion is protected, and it is a standard of the appropriate characteristics. But what's more interesting is they found further density close to the capsid shell, and we indeed identify a further 34 stem loops that are close to the capsid shell, have the right characteristics, but no signature of being in contact with the capsid shell. So these are clearly potential binding sites, but they are clearly unbound in the uh, extra signature here. So we also wanted to set out and understand better what they could actually mean. Is this actually meaningful from a mechanistic point of view? So again, to cut a long story short, what we then set out is to understand where do these unbound structures sit. And that's very revealing and actually quite interesting. So what I haven't told you yet, there's one copy of the maturation protein that replaces one of those TC dimers, and that's important for the exclusion of the genome in the end. And here we are color coding for you on the capsid in red, where we have unbinding, where we have basically packaging stickers that got lost, and in green, where they are still there. And what we see is there is an accumulation around this maturation protein that's important for the extrusion of the genome. So this has led us to, to um, propose that actually packaging sites unbind at some point during assembly or in later stages of the life cycle. Therefore, destabilize the lattice in strategic positions that then help the extrusion of maturation protein and um, the associated RNA that's bound to it. So this is, again, this uh, uh, genome release mechanism. It was already known that maturation protein has to get out. It is dragging the genome along. But how does the phage actually make sure that it does that in a coordinated way? And we believe that this is, again, orchestrated by these packaging sites here. <laughs> So another caveat I want to make that also comes out of this analysis is that VLPs are not always good proxies for the um, virus assembly. And the reason is that you don't see the same signatures of packaging sites in these situations. So what we've done here, we have compared a wild type page with one that has been assembled without maturation protein present, which so hasn't got that feature in it. And then you can compare again the distribution of these, um, of these uh, XRF data. So where do we have packaging sites present or not? And if the 
compare this data before you even identify the packaging sites themselves, you see that they are very different. The difference map, there is a very big similarity in the area of TR, so as expected, the, the main packaging site, but you lose the function of all the others around here, which is quite striking. So in order to understand the full might of those packaging sites, you really need to look at the full system and the wild type system, otherwise you will overlook those important parts. And this is also a message for people who want to use these delivery systems of uh, applications. A lot of people do this with MS2 as a workhorse in nanotechnology. So it is actually therefore very dangerous to, to omit parts like this because you omit part of an important essential mechanism here. So, the first part of my talk that I've shown you here is that not only the assembly phase is coordinated by these packaging sites, but actually we've shown you um, here an example that also the uncoating phase is affected by these packaging sites and their action. Now, we are interested in understanding and how that is carried out into different systems. And this is our study system, our model system. But Harvard already did a fantastic job telling you about how scaffolding proteins might act um, in, a, in a comparable way in other viruses here. I also would like to advertise recent work with the Towers Lab, which is um, on HIV, where we are arguing that the similar mechanism, so there's um, molecular frustration theory involved, talk to me if you want to know more, only have 15 minutes, I'm afraid, but there's a whole nice molecular frustration theory explaining these kind of frustrated states that lead to this exclu um, exclusion of the genome from MS2. So Similar uh, factors are at play here in HIV, but these are then um, uh, host factors that have this, the, this is similar function. But the, the, the theory that underpins it, so we have a theory of molecular frustration here, is similar in both cases. And again, talk to us if you want to know more. But I'd like to finish the talk on a system that I thought was quite instructive in the sense that it is not a virus system yet. It has hit on that same mechanism. I hope I can convince you that this mechanism is very fundamental and occurs even in a laboratory environment under certain conditions. So, what is the experiment in the Hilbert lab here? We have a bacterial enzyme that forms dodecamase from these pentagonal units, and what they've done is they have um, certainly permuted it so that they could fit the packaging signal of page lambda here, and then they were crafting lambda on two sides, on two ends, five from three from end of the messenger RNA of this uh, protein here. Then. They did directed evolution, which means that they, they look with um, of those uh, proteins assemble. They use nucleus treatment to weed those ones out that don't assemble well and continue several rounds of directed evolution um, and see what happens when they do so. And they found two really interesting messages here. So the first, which I already said was absolutely striking, is the fact that you can watch larger particles emerge, evolve, so that tells us a lot about early stages of evolution. But what also was very interesting as how we got in the mix is that they find higher packaging efficiency at a point that geometry doesn't change anymore. So first on the geometric part, so here you see these different particles that arise when this evolves. And these are very interesting from a structural point of view, because in contrast to viruses, you have these holes here. And the holes are there because in a customer, not all protein subunits are interacting with others, which is atypical for viruses. Usually, they all interact with others. This is not happening here. And I saw a poster yesterday to a nice chat there with someone who did something similar to talk to us uh, if you're in that business. Um, so this part of then we have uh, developed a new theory, Kasper Klug theory, all the mathematical theories that we have at present don't work for that, but we have a new theory that can capture that and is encompassing for all of that. So it's, uh, it's um, in the review stage already, and we are doing the revised version here, so we hope it's out pretty soon. And um, it's again talk to Father and I for that. But here I'm to make a case for you that actually packaging second made it assembly has evolved in the system. So let's look at the data of the Hilbert lab, which are quite striking here. 
So these are the different rounds of uh, evolution. And what you see here is sequencing of the content. So you see basically the, the messenger RNA, then you see some plasmid and some E. coli um, proportions. So you see initially in the capsids there's very, very little messenger RNA. This is the stage where we have one single packaging site. We do have a packaging site that's engineered in. But we see then later on, so up, it comes three to four, is the stage where geometry does not change anymore. So clearly from one to three, the volume is also increasing, which means that clearly it can package more. So we should factor this into our considerations here. But from three to four, there is no change in volume, but a, an enormous change in packaging uh, efficiency here. And you see this also when you look at the full genome, and that was kind of perfect. So, um, and what we set out then to do is to investigate whether from this step to the next, packaging for the made assembly has emerged. And I would be standing here if the answer wasn't yes. So you see, in addition to the B box, which is the uh, lambda signal, we have three others that are proximal and that work together in contractual. And it's very reminiscent of things we've seen with other viruses like SCNV, their beautiful papers in the past we've been presenting here. Uh, it, it really mimics that cassette of assembly nucleation here. So, take home message here is made assembly has spontaneously evolved in this laboratory environment, and so that brings me to my conclusions. We believe that packaging sites are the sort of entire viral life cycle, not just the assembly set, not primed for packaging and release. We have seen signatures of that in very different viral systems, including the spectral enzyme. And as you can guess, and obviously no time to expand on this, this is very important for applications in, in especially nanotechnology. So here is the team involved in that work I chose to speak about today. So that's our team here. Many of us are here, so, so check them out. Many of, of Peter's team are here as well, and it's a joint endeavor. It's really joint discovery, joint work here. Welcome to us, funded, and obviously a shout out to our collaborators in Zurich as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> So, do you have questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, can you, maybe, maybe I missed it. So, uh, the, when you talk, talk about the MS2 uncoating and the frustration, and in the, in the schematic you had, so the RNA coming out and then some of the capsule they still kind of bind into RNA. So, is, is the idea that it, it uh, um, that is, there's kind of like a semi-disassembly that the, the, they kind of stick, stick during the assembly still and kind of... Excellent right. question. So what happens here is that maturation protein binds to the esculus and gets reflected in. So what needs to happen is you need to get the maturation protein out of the capsid cell. So therefore what happens here is that those parts of the um, shell that are close to it needs to be destabilized. And this happens in two ways, and I think I haven't emphasized enough about two effects here. Number one is packaging sites obviously have to come off that are in the portion of the RNA that is first coming out as maturation protein. So first is obviously to get the RNA loose to come out. But the second thing is you want to destabilize the cell locally so to make it easier for maturation protein to come out. And this is the idea of this molecular frustration. So what I didn't emphasize enough, there are these two dimers, the symmetric and the asymmetric one. So it likes in solution predominantly to be in the symmetric form, but the timing of the stem loop makes the split in, the, in one of the key loops making it the asymmetric form. Now, in order to form the cell efficiency, there is earlier work by the Stockwell lab, if you don't have both species, you don't get the cells. You really need both. But now once it's in and packaging sites are falling off, you create local strain because the effector is no longer there. The only thing that keeps it in place is the lattice content. So therefore, when the effector goes, you destabilize the lattice content. This is this idea of the molecular frustration. 
And now the analogy in H. Perry is to understand the idea that the cofactor does the same thing and uses that same mechanism. So we think it's a broader phenomenon here, but it presents itself in MS2 in the form of these packaging slides. Okay. So, so far, one more question down there. So, ready? Okay. So, so um, I was wondering about the uh, footprinting uh, yeah. method. Uh, when you have activated species that diffuse, that will limit your resolution of the, the uh, molecule along the RNA molecule and also dynamic fluctuations. Can you comment on, yeah, on the yeah, spatial? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, a couple of points there. So, first, and that's the wonderful work that Rebecca Stan has really been, been fantastic about to, to make sure that you want only one mix per molecule. So you have to tune your experiments just right that the radiation is so that you don't get too many mixed on the same thing because otherwise you can't really interpret it well. But then the next thing is, and that's our challenge, we've expanded really well, is to, the real challenge is here that RNA-RNA or RNA-protein interactions show up in the same signature as the risk. And that's obviously a problem. So we developed a lot of techniques to get around that problem. So these different maps, we throw the whole kitchen sink up. So everything you know about the system. So for instance, you know a few features about it in the transcript. You use this as a comparator with the packaged structures. Then obviously you have tertiary effects where something leans on that can also protect. So you have also these effects. So you have to factor in quite a few extra ideas to actually tease it out of the data. So it's not just a matter of do a structure prediction. You can't just get your M and B values that perhaps presented with simply five the first thing you do, yes. But then you need to really tease out those differences. Yeah. So Sorry, I think we need to do another couple of questions like for writing during the coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Ryan. So the next speaker will be Ali Bruce that will speak about the the Great War, the creation of cytofactor factors, and what the genesis of cytofactor. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kylie, and I just recently finished my undergrad in Hanover College, which is a teeny tiny little teaching college in Indiana, not Germany, different Hanover. Okay. So, as I'm sure we're all aware, and a lot of you have stated throughout the week, there's a huge problem, um, and that is antibiotic resistance due to the overuse and overprescription, as well as misuse of antibiotics, leading to, again, that increase in antibiotic resistance. And some data is showing that by 2050, antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic resistance are going to be one of the leading causes of death, with around 10 million deaths a year. So there's a huge problem there. Along with this, we have the escape and space pathogens, which is just an easy way to remember the highly virulent and antibiotic resistant pathogens. Um, and a lot of people are focused on some of these, but one that's not really covered a lot is Citrobacter. Uh, which is interesting because Citrobacter, and in this case, when I say Citrobacter, I mean Citrobacter for UDI. That's what we use in our lab. Um, we have limited resources, and that's one of the strains we have. Um, is part of the Enterobacter family. It's also associated primarily with healthcare infections, so those nosocomial infections like UTIs, endocarditis, respiratory infections. It's found in food, water, the intestines of animals, and us. Um, and it's become increasingly multi-drug resistant. So it's interesting that we're not doing a lot of work with this bacteria. So what do we do? Where do we go? How do we solve this problem? We can go back to the past as we are seeing a resurgence in phage therapy, which a lot of you have already talked about. So just to kind of touch on that and why phages, why their life cycle makes sense, this is the lytic life cycle. I'm going to ignore the lysogenic for now. It's kind of the same means to an end um, in one way or another. But so we have attachment, entry, the synthesis and assembly, and then the fourth step, the last step, exit, is kind of the important one when we're looking at phages and their use for phage therapy. So essentially, when the viral progeny are ready, they burst forth lysing, lysing the cell, which kills the host. Um, and so you can see why that would be important for fighting bacterial infections, for killing the host, so hopefully ridding the infections. So essentially, in short terms, they have a license to kill. Horrible joke early in the morning. I know, I know. 
Um, so we work with um, phages and isolated from the environment. So we kind of work with two main ones. They're both picture phages. Um, so that's me on the left. And the one I isolated, I isolated from a drainage ditch on our college campus. And then on the right is one of our lab members, Owen, who isolated a picture phage from a lake near the college campus called Lake Iowa. So to do that, there are kind of two ways you can do that. You have an enrichment and an overlay. They start out the same, you collect the sample, you filter the sample, and then for an enrichment, which is what Owen did to select for those picture phages, he did fresh media, filtered the sample, and then put the picture vector and the filtered sample in there. He lysed the bacterial cells, colored out the bacterial cells, and then filtered the supernatant. And then once you get through that, the overlay and the enrichment basically become the same process. So then you do an overlay, and then once that overlay is dry, you incubate at 30 degrees overnight. And hopefully, you get something that looks like this. So a huge clearing, a phase cloud, if you will. Um, but that's not very helpful. That's a bunch of different phases, not really isolated, not one type of phase. So then we have to purify um, and get isolated phases, which I'm sure all of us know. But um, you streak for isolation, and hopefully you get less and less phase as you streak. And then eventually, you hope to get these platforming units that are uniform, similar, indicating to us that we have only one type of phage. So on the top there is PV1, and on the bottom is LI. So once we did that, one of the important things, especially looking forward to like phage therapy and things like that, is characterizing these phages, which is kind of a focus of our lab, is characterizing these environmental phages. Um, and we focused on such a doctor, like I said. But we also tried for E. coli, salmonella, and Shigella, those are closely related, um, and found that KB1 and LI both are only uh, Citrobacter specific. Uh, so that was interesting. So going forward with that, we did an efficiency of plating assay, and we found that KB1 starts to kind of drop off as you get warmer, but LI stays pretty consistent as the temperature changes, which is a good thing. Um, it can be kept at different temperatures, and you're not really going to have much of an issue there. Um, and then Owen went on to do more temperature assays with LI. Maybe one proved to be um, a bit finicky, uh, gave us a lot of problems. Um, but he did different temperatures, so our control was 4 degrees Celsius, because that's what we store our phages at. Um, and then he did negative 20, 40, 62, and 95. He decided that the 95 one was interesting because it had such a drastic drop within five minutes. So he decided to look at 95 degrees and just how fast that's happening. So within about two minutes, you're already seeing about 30% platforming units remaining. So it's kind of that drastic drop that he saw. Another way we can do that is to characterize stages is their structural proteins. So we use SDS page to determine the range of sizes in both the phages. And so we kind of got three main things for each of them. So a majority of the proteins are around 45 kilodaltons, that dark band. Um, several are around 65, 54, and 13. And then this one appears to have around five major proteins that make up KB1. A lot is a bit different. Um, so a majority of its proteins are around 40. Um, it has 160 and 10 kilodalton proteins, and it appears to have way more proteins than KB1 does. We were able to image LI thanks to Dr. Spoonda at Michigan State. Um, we don't have any of the technology to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, so we were able to image it and found that LI was a myophage. So that was something fun and interesting we have to do. And so just some conclusions for this first part. Uh, we successfully isolated two switcher vector phages. Uh, both have narrow host ranges, as far as we know. The efficiency of KB1 varies with changes in temperature, where we don't necessarily see that too much with LI. Um, and then our SDS page determined that there are way more proteins in LI than KB1. We determined the temperature stability, more or less, of LI, and that LI is a myophage. So kind of some future directions for the first part is phase library at Hanover College, the imaging of KV1, if it will cooperate, um, and genome sequencing of KV1 and LI. You're probably thinking that that looks pretty sparse for a library, and I will get to that in a moment. Um, so I've talked about the phase, the host, seeing as this is a virus host interaction section, I should probably talk about their interaction. Um, so host specificity, as I'm sure a lot of us are aware, phage infects specific bacterial 
um, lines and cell lines, and then they eject any plant acid into the host cell, and then we are looking to determine what part of the host the phage is taking advantage of to complete its life cycle. So we can do that with a transposon mutagenesis library. So this is kind of my work um, right before I graduated. Uh, so we do this by taking a wild type bacterial cell. We have the DNA, which is the white circle. We insert, introduce a transposon, which is the red X. These are electrocompetent cells uh, with transposon A5. And then eventually you get a bunch of different mutants represented by these different colors as the transposon inserts itself into these different parts of the bacterial cell's genome. And this creates the library. So once we do that, we can start to look at these different mutants. So first, we take the wild type, we plate it with the phage, we get that. Makes sense. And then we look at like the purple mutant, and we still get flat. So this indicates to us that the mutation is either not a receptor for the phage, or it's not necessarily important for the phage life cycle. Um, and then with the yellow mutant, though, when we do plate it and get no platforming units, this is something we want to look into because the mutation must be in a receptor-related gene or a gene important for the phage life cycle. So we started to do this, and you get we got five plates that look like that. So each one of those little dots is a mutant. And then we have to individually toothpick off each of those mutants. So we had about 12,000 to 13,000 mutants that we ended up working with. Um, and then we put them into 96 world plates like this. And you get a stack like this. And that's about 2,000 mutants. And you're probably wondering what happened to the other 10,000. And uh, <laughs> so earlier I was talking about the library, and it was sparse and this. We had an equipment malfunction like my last year before I graduated. It killed most of our phase stocks as well as 10,000 of our mutants. So we are currently starting over, um, which is why we're kind of in the beginning of this research. So that is okay. <laughs> because our future directions, we want to screen the citrus after mutants, determine which genes are important for identification and replication of phase. Um, and just some acknowledgments, I'd like to thank Dr. Kundar at MSU, all the people at Hanover, Hubs, and then as well as the organizers for giving me the chance to talk to you all, as well as you all, for your attention. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start our talk. Do you have any questions, suggestions, or comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, a very interesting organism, and it's time that we look at the phages. Do you know um, which structure the O antigen of your uh, uh, Citrobacter has? Um, I don't think we're entirely sure of which o, uh, of the O antigen. Again, we have pretty... So you didn't yeah. serotype it. Um, my question is, um, um, there are Cytobacter that have the same O antigen like the uh, e heck E. coli, which is O157, which uh, causes uh, this uh, uh, toxin E. coli um, 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 pathogenesis uh, picture. So, because it is a very relevant yeah. uh, story, so it would be worth to, to look at the portion of it. Hi, over here. So I'm curious, how many of your mutants have repeated? Like, how many of your your mutations were repeats? Because you said you picked like 10,000 plots, but I would think that after so many mutations, you would exhaust what you could find. So why so many? Yeah. Um, so we didn't get that far actually. So we were still in those first stages when they all got killed. So. I'm sure there are repeats, definitely. I'm sure there's repeats on repeats, so yeah. We didn't get very far um, at all, but yeah. Another question? Um, I know you said that you guys have limited resources, uh, so maybe not at Hanover, but maybe with a collaborator, you could find someone um, to help with the TNC screen in like a more high throughput way um, and save you a lot of the stuff. stuff. Yeah. So I love to fix nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe do it in like a uh, like more super space. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a question down there. Uh, I 
Thank you. Oh, same question. Okay, so I have one question. Yes. Yeah. Um, you consider features to the lots of features in the play and then to the bacteria on top of the system to get the selection system for getting the resistance to that? Yes, we actually talked about that this morning. Um, that's going to be one of the projects one of the other undergrads takes on. So I kind of more or less lost two years of research out of my four years. <laughs> I didn't have time to do very much, but we were talking about that this morning, and that's the plan for some of the other undergrads to kind of take over. One last question. Thanks for the talk. Um, uh, this is more of a very naive question because I'm working with something that has isolated in the third of your kind of fresh stuff. So, when you do the SDF page uh, and you say that, okay, this page is more protein than the other, is there a way to kind of uh, do you control the amount of protein actually put on the put on the gel? Because, like, theoretically, if you just overload the gel, you would kind of probably pick uh, more of the painter band. So, is this controlled or is yeah. that a nice way to do it? Yeah, we've kind of like optimized it with other things and we have like a way of, yeah, we've done it a couple times. We also optimize the um, experiment and things like that. So, yeah, we kind of have ways to figure out. Okay, so let's thank again, Tyler. And if you have any other suggestions, just come to see her and the next speaker will join you. Thank you. That was the latest news I got. We have to change it to win. Okay, so can you hear me? Okay, so, so it's, uh, I want to thank the organizer to give me the opportunity to be this amazing event and also an amazing place. So I, I'm going to tell, uh, 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 let's start. So uh, one of the phase, probably one of the best understood phase, and we are already here a lot during the meeting and also many of the posts, uh, uh, you can see a lot of detail. So so I want to show this, start with this uh, almost 50 years old picture. So you can see the phase with a large cap thing with short tail, and uh, in fact, uh, salmonella. And uh, 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 they're structurally probably the best studied phase because there's so many crystal structure, cryon structure, and uh, many of the experts are here, so it's so, uh, a beautiful structure here. So, so why we want to work on that? Because it's probably one of the best studies. So I want to see why we want to say, first we want to say how the individual V-run looks like. And we want to see how to interact with the host. Uh, in particular, we want to show how we form the channel across the um, um, bac bacterial envelope and to allow DNA ejection. And um, then, obviously, you will see how they actually are standing. So I want to have a three question uh, uh, infection and uh, channel formation and also give a little bit of a sense of how they are standing. Uh, again, many experts are here, so I just want to hopefully show from very naive point of view, we can provide something hopefully new. And uh, so obviously to study the infection, we run you see from a uh, genus lab, we also use cryogen. Cryogen became very powerful, we all know very well. So we want to show, we started with this many years ago, start with the to provide the phase, so we have a TM work on the infectious particle. And uh, the key thing I want to show is uh, this is uh, we want to get an asymmetric structure at the uh, a near atomic resolution. So to remind you of this, the cap uh, structure you see there, uh, uh, we use a simple movie to show the cap, the head, and tail. And one of the key things here is the symmetry mismatching. As we all know, uh, the cap we have this five-fold vertex and with six-fold tail, with 12-fold portal. Uh, portal. Yeah, this makes it actually very complicated. And uh, so this is again just to show you uh, this with all the major elements. So if we zoom into the, the one of the vortex, uh, you can see this beautiful structure with many of the structure already be installed by Cryem and the crystal uh, graphic approach. And so the key thing is how this actually, the portal in turn with bifold the uh, capsule. So that requires asymmetric reconstruction. Uh, I want to show you a, a, a slide uh, through this uh, 
uh, is reconstructing. And you may start notice that there's a color code region. And this is actually, you can see the bridging between the portal and the cafe. But this bridge is not around in other area. That's just a show. You can see this, this interaction is required as a matter of reconstruction. And this may sound easy, but it was not very easy even just a couple of years ago. And so, again, we want to zoom in this again to the portal and the capital interface. And uh, we zoom in to start to see uh, the cycle. Uh, and this is a schematic structure. All the same. I highlight the loop region. But uh, uh, in the asymmetric reconstruction, you can see the conformation change under this loop. Uh, that interface with the portal region. And because this uh, 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 asymmetric reconstruction, we can start to see uh, uh, specific interaction. And I just highlight a couple of them. And you can start to see the same uh, loop in a different conformation to allow to interaction with different portal uh, uh, interaction. And there's a lot of uh, this interaction we already identified. And this allows this portal to stabilize interact with the capital. It's extremely important for, 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 for infectious particles. And so now we can actually show this is actually, uh, this is all the confirmation is important. And uh, uh, again, I want to show the portal, uh, uh, the top page, GP5, have all the local confirmation change at this region. And, uh, and, uh, and the, the GP1 and GP4 have all have this specific local uh, confirmation change. And this all the confirmation channel, most of them located at the interface. Again, uh, this is again to allow them to stably uh, sampling together. And uh, this is a, a one part of so we have a, a whole structure just like a genus lab did. But, uh, uh, so now we want to see the second is how this page forms the emerald channel. So in this case, we use a prior electron tomography with a mini cell in fact with the P22. And we've been working on this for many years. I just remind you, one of the things we did for many years is in fact the mini cell, salmonella mini cell with, with stage particle. And this is just a two series. And generated reconstruction, a slicing from the top to the, to the, to the uh, bottom. And then you obviously can see many Nice, and it, you can pay attention with DNA packing. In this case, DNA already released. And then the channel uh, form with the envelope. And a lot of detail, obviously, is very difficult to digest, so we need to stop from one average. And the middle panel is while the average compared with the three uh, phase, you can start seeing this, what we call 40 nanometer channel. Uh, from the, the bottom of the uh, stage tail to cross out membrane, ultimately from the channel, allow DNA translocation. And so this is just the surface rendering, uh, give you sense of this 40 nanometer channel from bottom of the, the face. And so now we see this for many years. So part of the question we want to see is how this actually has family. And uh, through this uh, one protein called GP10, and uh, so we we asked this question. Uh, we had to go to the one of the three mysterious protein in P P P22 is this three ejection protein GP7, GP16, and 20. And the one of the things we really know if you remove any of the protein, we we'll lose infectivity. And so this is the. Uh, 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 Reconstruction, you can see the phage still assembling, and the, the, the difference from the white type is uh, there's something inside, presumably, um, um, the double string DNA. And if you compare white type and the mutant, you can see striking difference. Most uh, differences inside the, the, uh, the uh, tail regions of the lumen. Uh, and in this case, the luminous free ejection protein was packing inside here. Um, but the structure is in disorder in our case. And then up without this free ejection protein from this DNA in the way. So if we, in fact, uh, you call uh, a salmonella with, uh, with this uh, mutant, 
and you can see this will absorb very well. However, we don't form this channel underneath the GP10. And this, and, and this is very clear, they don't form uh, the, the ex we call external channel um, here. And, but if we delete uh, only two G, and in this case, you need a 16 and 20, and they form very well, and, uh, and uh, then we can start to see this extracellular channel. And this extracellular have a 12 copy, uh, with a 6 copy of the CPK. And so to have a surface rendering, so you can start to see it. And uh, uh, so, uh, sorry. So go back. And so I want to see if I can see what this is going to play. Okay, so now you can see uh, here's a GP10 and the GP7 from a, a 12 copy right under this. So perfectly extend the pair, the, uh, the interact regions are highly conserved. So allow them to extend to through the GP10 uh, um, um, hop. And the ratio is uh, 1 to 2. Um, and they are very conserved, and they, they cross, they allow them to cross the, uh, in, into the out member. So now with that, we can ask next, uh, how do you need this uh, called GP16? And so now we have a structure to able, allow this, not only extend uh, the external channel, but also cross the out member. And uh, this all together presumably allow uh, 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 channel, the whole channel formation. So we have a simple uh, uh, model to explain when the P22 interact with LPS, ultimately uh, interact with the outer membrane to uh, allow the extracellular channel form by GP7. Then ultimately GP20 form which to cross these two to membrane and then ultimately GP16 from the pore in the inner membrane. That's what ultimately allow the genome uh, ejection. And uh, with that, we want to go to the one more question. So can we see this phage assembly in the host? This has been studied for 50 years as one well of the picture I showed you earlier. Uh, because of the power of the cryofit milling, as we saw yesterday, and many other work. So we now start to use, uh, uh, want to use this state many to look at uh, the cell. Uh, other reason is that typically E. coli, some nanas, they are typically too big. So we have to use state and FIB. And uh, uh, here's just an example. Uh, this is the SDN picture with some nana cell, and many of them tapping very tightly. Uh, with state many, so you can start the cutting uh, generate a very thin lamella, about 200 nanometers. Uh, this 200 nanometer is trans more transparent for high uh, imaging. And uh, so this is just a picture we can see, uh, a very, very low map picture. You can see a lot of bacteria with infect with uh, phage. And to convince you the phage, so we can actually zoom in. And so you can start appreciate all this uh, similar thing we saw from Johnson King 50 years ago with all the packing with space. And the cool thing about this image is they are allow tomography uh, imaging. So again, this is just show you. Uh, um, uh, you can start the phage material capsule and the capsule. And by slicing through, so you can hopefully see a lot of the uh, phage inside, including different very safe. Uh, we are in the early stage. I don't want, we don't know much about it. That's one reason we share with you. Hopefully we learn from you and uh, how much we can learn from it. And uh, again, just to show you one more example. And so you can hopefully appreciate the packing almost like crystal um, very nicely. And uh, uh, with, with phage, also have a pro phage and many things. But if you pay really attention, you have to see more. So I want to see you one more picture to convince you. Actually, you see something really cool and new, unexpected, hopefully, to many experts here. So you can see just some page-like structure. 
So how this looks like, so obviously we use subtonogram average, and so this is to show you what we saw is and uh, the pageant structure actually wrapping around to only protect the, the, the tail uh, uh, the skin inside the cell. And uh, obviously we have no idea what's the function uh, of this cage, uh, but this is kind of showcase the power of technology allow us to see something that has been literally studied for 50 some years. And so I, I want to summarize with uh, we see many different space structures, uh, including this cage, and we have this uh, 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 high resolution structure of the infectious particle. We also see uh, the channel across the outer membrane to really allow the DNA translocation. And uh, this is all in the context, hopefully, in a, a context that, uh, uh, sorry. So we are in a context to see um, uh, Mr. And uh, that's actually very important because we, uh, so we can literally start to how the stage uh, infects the particle, start infection, ultimately uh, packaging, and many other steps to allow this whole life cycle. But what, what I should hopefully just a small step of many, uh, 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 many uh, life cycle. Uh, uh, the life cycle of the P22. So with that, I want to just uh, show most of the work was done by Ting Yen. Uh, many people may recognize uh, it was in the last year's uh, uh, first meeting. And he was, she was helped by other people. And uh, we have a very amazing Kai Yen resource at the year. And uh, all this will not be possible without me and, uh, and, uh, and support from, from my life. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. We're perfect in time, so we have time for questions. Mark? Do you know what protein it is? And then it looks like you impose pixel symmetry. It would make sense, but did you try to see why or anything like that? No, uh, we don't know what's that, but uh, we, we speculate it's a uh, host protein. A host protein? Yeah, we don't know. But it's, uh, it's uh, um, um, I would say it's uh, almost uh, most of the page is have page to the run. And then what about the symmetry that looks like you impose six poles? Yeah, we do post symmetry, but you can see almost uh, uh, nicely interact with the, the tail machine. There, there's this interaction. That's why I show this movie. We show different uh, uh, subclass. You can see start to assembling uh, uh, from certain area. So there's presumably uh, there's this interaction. We don't know anything, but I assume many of the experts here can give me more things. So uh, absolutely beautiful work as always. Uh, the illustration at the end, you indicated that the cages are associated with every capsid. Are they associated with every capsid containing DNA? Or they also, do you also see them in the pro-capsids that are at the periphery of the tomato? Um Yeah, we don't see in the pro-capsid. Pro we only see in the uh, majority of the mature capsid. And, uh, yeah, around the mature phase. So, so we didn't see in other case, but, but almost most of them have had a case, but in different uh, uh, different states. Okay, great. Thanks. Beautiful. Always beautiful. Oh, thank you. Quick question: um, When you knock out all three ejection proteins, the barrel disappears. Is that accurate? Yes. So, so. It kind of suggests that this support hypothesis that ejections are somewhere around the barrel and may plunge into the 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 the, the, the cage channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think as you use your poster still, you need some of the um, the ejection protein, even just one, 
you can start to see the barrel have a have a have a this clap and it's so clearly important. And also, uh, with all the thermogram we show if you after being after channel formation, the barrel barrel also disrupted. So presumably there is some kind of correlation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So now you have a structure of the ejection process outside, right? Can you uh, figure out what it would be a structure inside? Oh yeah, we put a lot of effort. I'm, I'm, I saw uh, Gina's lab also put a lot of effort, but we, I don't think we see defined structure, and uh, that's very different from from what Ian showed yesterday. P P7 is a very organized structure. So we, we we don't know the reason, but uh, we try uh, different class average. It's clearly uh, not order, um, but the structure outside is clearly very order. That really actually allows them to interact with the tail uh, uh, extension uh, and cross the, um, uh, the envelope. Oh, at least the, what we show clearly is the segment that the, the first thing came out is presumably GP7. That allowed them to interact with GP10. Then GP20 and the GP60. So presumably sequentially. And this is the mutants things to do. Last question, Bob. I'm curious if you have an idea how the ejection proteins get into the, the channel. So we've shown the ejection proteins get into the protein by interacting with scaffolding protein, right? And then they have to somehow move into that channel while DNA is activated. So, yeah, we, have idea how we have an idea. We have zero. I have a zero idea, but you may have or some other people. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, thank you. I have a couple of questions more that we need to go ahead. Thanks for the very good Jim. That was great. So, I love to ask some questions. Let's move on. Now we have. Christina Sasenko, that is always about criticizing patient infection to value the type of fire for people. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Christina. I am a PhD student in Alan Davidson's lab at the University of Toronto. And today I'm going to be telling you about my project that focuses on understanding how phages interact with one of their most common host cell receptors, the type 4 pillars. And as Alan mentioned yesterday, we're really interested in engineering phages for phage therapy. And in order to do this, we need to understand the proteins that are involved in mediating interactions with host cell receptors. So why the type 4 pillar? Oh, no. Where am I supposed to point it? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so the type 4 pillus is this long and thin grappling hook like structure that extends from the surface of the cell and it's involved in a variety of bacterial processes such as twitching motility and biofilm formation. So here I'm just showing you a TEM of uh, this type 4 pillus of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is the model bacteria system that we work on. And you can see it's these long hairs that extend from the surface of the cell. And over here on the left, I'm just showing you a general schematic of the type 4 pillars. And what I want to direct your attention to is this protein in purple here called pill A. And this is the protein that actually makes up the type 4 pillars fiber. So pill A monomers dynamically polymerize and depolymerize in order to extend and retract. And this extension and retraction is what gives the pillars functionality. Now type 4 pillars is not unique to Pseudomonas. It's actually found in a broad spectrum of bacteria. And in most cases, it is considered a key and concerned valence factor. So the fact that it is a virulence factor uh, is broadly distributed, and the fact that phages are naturally able to target the type 4 pillars makes this a great structure for designing phage-based therapeutics kits. And that's what my project focuses on. And in order, um, and what we're trying to do is understand uh, the proteins that are involved in mediating these interactions, because despite it being a really well-known structure for phage infection, not a lot is known about their interactions. So previously, uh, we have worked with the well-characterized pseudomonas phage called DMS3. This is a stifle phage that requires a type 4 pillus. And what we've shown is that following the central fiber protein, there's actually only one gene that encodes a protein that's found in the phage particle. Uh, and we know that proteins downstream of the central fiber are often involved in recognizing host cell receptors. 
And we've shown that this protein in particular is involved in mediating type 4 pill specificity and interacting with the type 4 pillars. Now, unfortunately, this was not the case for all type 4 pill stages of pseudomonas. So we turned our attention to a more diverse group of stages that seem to have really interesting tail structures. And we call these, prote- or these phages the F10 like phages because they're similar to the pseudomonas typing phage F10. Now, when we take a look at their tail regions, which is what I'm showing you here, you can see it's a much different story. And they have actually eight different genes that encode proteins found in the phage particle. And although we know these phages require the type 4 pillars for infection, none of these proteins share any significant sequence similarity to that previously identified protein in DMS phase. And just as a note, we refer to these proteins as close binding proteins. So this suggests that these axon like phages uh, may have different close binding proteins and might be interacting with the type 4 pillars in a different way or a different component of the type 4 pillars. So we really want to try and hammer out how these different phages are interacting with the type 4 pillars. So to do this, we took a good look at their genomes. And what we were actually really interested to find is that these F10 like phages encode a protein that shares sequence similarity to a type 4 pillars protein called FIMU. Now, I'll get to what FIMU is in a second, but here I'm just showing you the multiple sequence alignment of the bacterial uh, PAO1 FIMU. So PAO1 is just a lab strain of Pseudomonas vaginosa as well as for what I refer to as phage you like proteins. And these are from the F10-like phages, F10, JBD68, LES2, and LES3. So overall, they share about 30% amino acid sequence identity, uh, with the phage uh being more similar to each other, ranging from about 78 to 95% identical. Now, what exactly is FIMU, and why do we really care about this? So as I mentioned before, the type 4 pillars is largely made up of this protein called pill A, and we refer to this as the major pillin protein. FIMU is one of the five proteins that are collectively referred to as the minor pillin proteins. And these are found in much lower abundance, and they're actually predicted to be found at the very tip of the type 4 pillus fiber. Uh, and FIMU in particular is thought to act as an adapter that connects uh, the minor pillin complex to the major pillin uh, pill A. And all these minor pillins are required for type 4, a proper type 4 pillus assembly and function. And it's thought that they may actually play a role in initiating pillay polymerization. So our question became, why do these F10-like phages encode a protein that shows sequence similarity to the type 4 pillus protein FIMU? And we thought the answer to this question could lie in superinfection exclusion. Perhaps they're, uh, they're blocking the infection of other type 4 pillus dependent phages. And we thought maybe this could tell us something about how these phages are interacting. So to first get an idea as to whether or not these phage FIMU like proteins are playing a role in superinfection exclusion, we cloned each of these proteins onto a plasmid and then express them in different strains of pseudomonas aeruginosa. And I tested the ability of different type 4 pillar stages to infect strains that are expressing these phage FIMU like proteins. And what we'd expect that if these proteins are playing a role in mediating superinfection exclusion, when we express these proteins, we should see that some phages have decreased uh, packing efficiency relative to the empty vector control. So here I'm just showing you uh, an example of one of these phage FIMU like proteins. So along the side are the phages that I tested, and along the top is a strain of Pseudomonas PAO1 as expressing either empty vector or uh, one of the phage FIMU like proteins. I'm just showing you JBD68 as an example. Uh, and I also have a strain of Pseudomonas PAO1 that has had its uh, endogenous bacterial FIMU not dead. Now, starting over here, you can see that all the phages that I tested are able to infect PAO1. But in the absence of FIMU, uh, we get a loss of infection of JBD68, LES2, and LES3, so the F10-like phages, as well as D3112, which is a phage that's very similar to DMS3. It seems to have one canonical close by new protein. Uh, and the packing efficiency of DMS3 also does decrease. Now, when I express uh, the phage FIMU like protein from JBD68, what's really interesting is that the F10-like phages, JBD68, and LES3 are blocked whereas LES2 and the CDMS3 like phages are able to infect. And this is true for all the different phage FIMU like proteins across three different strains of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just really briefly, we see the same phenotype in the native F10 lysogens. So here I'm just showing you LES3 as an example. So again, you see that JD68 and LES3 are blocked, whereas LES2 and the DMS3 like phages are not. And we've shown that this uh, blocking is mediated by phage FIMU because when we knock it out, JD68 is now able to infect. So next we wanted to see if these phage FIMU like proteins were disrupting type 4 pillars activity. And one assay that we have as a readout for this is called the twitching motility assay. So as I mentioned earlier, twitching motility is regulated by the type 4 pillars. 
And during this motility, the type 4 pillus actually extends from the surface of the cell, and then the tip of the pillus adheres to the surface, and the pillus retracts. And with that, it drags the body of the cell towards the end of that stuck pillus. And with repeated rounds of this, you can see your cells moving outwards. So to perform, uh, you can use this twitching motility as a readout for pillus activity. Uh, and to do this assay, it's really simple. You just pick a colony and stab it right through an agar plate to the bottom of a plastic petri dish. And this plastic is the surface that the cells are going to twitch upon. And following the incubation period, you can remove this agar, stain your cells using crystal violet. And if the cells are twitching, you see the formation of this ring around where you initially inoculated your colony. Uh, and you can measure this diameter and use this as a readout of pillus activity. So to see if these phase from like proteins are disrupting a pillus activity, we did a kitchen motility in PAO1 expressing these different phase from like proteins and compared it to um, a PAO1 empty vector. So just starting over here on the left, you can see again in the absence of FMU, there's decreased surface pileation, which causes a significant decrease in kitchen motility relative to the empty vector. And when we express any of these different phase from like proteins, we're not seeing a decrease in kitchen motility suggesting that these phage stimuli proteins are blocking the epitomic phages without disrupting type 4 pillus activity. So next we wanted to see if they're actually being incorporated into the type 4 pillus fiber. So to do this, I repeated these two experiments using PAO1 FIMU knockout. And the reason that we were able to do this is because in the absence of FIMU, as I mentioned, there's decreased surface pileation, which causes decreased twitching motility, and also decreased type 4 pillus dependent phage infection. And based on the data we've seen so far, if these phase from like proteins are being incorporated into the type 4 pillars, what we'd expect to see is that when we express them in a FIMU knockout, we should see restored twitching motility as well as restored infection of certain type 4 pillars dependent phases. Uh, and that's actually exactly what we saw. So again, I'm just showing the same assays, but this time in a PAO1 FIMU knockout. So this is PAO1 FIMU knockout with FD vector, the wild type bacterial complement. And again, I'm just showing you the phase from U like protein from JVD68 as a control. So, again, in the absence of FIMU, we have decreased clocking efficiency. And this is restored when we complement back with the bacterial PAO1 FIMU. And when we express any of the phase from U like proteins, we save the same phenotype that we saw in wild type PAO1. The JVD68 and LES3 are not infecting, but LES2 and the DMS3 like phages are. And likewise, when we perform the twitching motility assays, we see that expression of any of the different phage from new like proteins restores twitching motility uh, compared to the empty vector. And it's even greater than that of the bacterial PAO1 from new complement. Uh, so this kind of led us, uh, you know, overall what this is suggesting is that these phage from new like proteins are being incorporated into the pills. And they're doing so in such a way uh, that they're not disrupting type 4 pills activity, but they're specifically blocking the infection of the external phages. And this led us to the hypothesis that these uptime like phages might actually be recognizing the minor pillins or FIMU during infection. Uh, and from this, we would infer that these uptime like phages are actually binding at the very tip of the type 4 pillus, where the minor pillin proteins are predicted to be found. So, to try and visualize this, I incubated PAO1 cells with either DMS3, which is a phage that's not blocked, or JBD68, a phage that is blocked by these phage FIMUs. And I visualized their interactions with the type 4 pillus using uh, TEM. Oh, I skipped to the first line there. Uh, so previously, it's been reported uh, for pseudomonas phages that interact with the type 4 pillus. They actually bind along the length of the type 4 pillus fiber, suggesting they interact with the major pillin protein. And that's exactly what we saw for DMS3. So you can see it's binding along the length of this type 4 pillus fiber, uh, suggesting this interaction with the major pillin protein, pill L. Oh. And for JBD68, which is being blocked by these phage from like proteins, we're seeing specific binding of these phages at the very tip of the type 4 pillars, where the minor pillin proteins are predicted to be found. And this suggests that these F10 like phages, which are being blocked, are binding at the very tip of the type 4 pillars, interacting with the minor pillin proteins. And this is to our knowledge the first example of a tailed pseudomonas phage actually interacting with the tip of the type 4 pillars. So finally, kind of bringing this back full circle, we want to try and identify the phage proteins in these F10 like phages that are involved in interacting with the type 4 pillars, and perhaps with the minor pillin proteins and regulating these different specificities we're seeing. So to do this, we took advantage of the fact that these ephtonic phages are very similar in sequence in their tail region, but LES2 in particular is not actually susceptible to these phage from mediated defenses. So what we were looking for is uh, uh, proteins in this tail region that were different between LES2 and the other ephtonic phages that were being blocked. 
it really left us with three candidates. That's GP18, GP19, and GP24. Now, previously, we had made deletions of these three genes in GVD68, and what we found is that 18 and 19 are both essential, whereas GP24 is not. And given that the recognition of host cell receptors is the first step in phage infection, we would expect these genes to be essential. So we kind of ruled our GP24 as our candidate right away. So I'll this with 18 and 19. So to see if these proteins are playing a role in mediating these different specificities we're seeing, I performed a complementation experiment where I took a knockout of GP19 and JVD68 and I complemented it with the homologs uh, of 18 and 19 from LES2. And again, we're able to do this because LES2 is not susceptible to these phage free mediated defenses. So because of this, you can see that LES2 can plaque on PAO1, but it also plaques on a PAO1 LES3 lysogen. And this is what JVD, a strain JVD68 cannot plaque on. And we've shown that, again, this is just a repeat from earlier, uh, this repression we see of JVD68 on the LES3 lysogen is due to the phage free new light protein. Because when we delete it, JVD68 is not able to infect. So when I complement the JVD68 GP19 mutant uh, with just the wild type genes from JVD68, we're able to restore infection on PAL1. But again, we're not getting infection on the LES3 lysogen. But when I complement this mutant with the genes from LES2, we get res a restoration of infection on PAL1. But we're also now getting JVD68 infecting this LES3 lysogen. So this suggests that the 1819 uh, in our homologs could potentially be involved in interacting with the type 4 torus and mediating these different specificities we're seeing. So in summary, what I've shown you here today is that some phages, like DMS3, uh, seem to have a single pillus binding protein, and they're actually interacting with the major pillin protein PLA along the length of the type 4 pillars. Uh, other phages, like these acrylate phages, seem to have their own unique pillus binding proteins that have these kind of weird tails. And we're actually seeing them bind at the very tip of the type 4 pillars, where the minor pillin proteins are predicted to be found. And we're able to elucidate this mechanism because these f like phages encode a protein that shows sequence similarity to the type 4 pillars protein in you. And when we express this protein, we actually see that these f like phages are now unable to infect, whereas DMS3, which is binding along the length of the type 4 pillars, is unaffected. And this is, to our knowledge, the first example not only of phages co-opting a type 4 pillars protein for the mechanism of superinfection exclusion, but it's also the first example we've seen of a tailed phage actually finding at the tip of the pillars where the minor pillars proteins are predicted to be found. Uh, so with that, I would just like to thank all the members of my lab, especially Natal, who did a lot of work with this phage, um, my supervisor, Alan, uh, of course, the Maxwell Lab, who's always had great insight for me, and our collaborators at McMaster University and our funding sources. Uh, as well as uh, the organizers for letting me speak today. Thank you. Great talk. Okay, I'm start again. Are there any questions in the audience? Um, this is a great project. Oh, thank thank you. Lot. Um, could you um, isolate the individual uh, phage originating uh, pillows protein um, in vitro and just mix it with the phage to block infection? Yeah, so we definitely want to do that uh, for JVD68. So we've done it for DMS3 before, and it does work, um, but we haven't done it for these uptime phages yet. So I do have a question. Yeah. Uh, from your readout, you are blocking infection, but can you distinguish from the possibility that you could visit and block the interaction? Like a or that you are just inhibiting the more the right uh, We haven't looked at that yet. We've tried to do some absorption assays. It's kind of hard to do it with these stages. Uh, they don't absorb very well, um, but it's something we're trying to figure out right now. So we don't have problems because I mean, you can easily break the TV, I guess. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that, yeah, exactly. They're very fragile, so I think during the absorption, we could perhaps be steering them off. It's kind of notoriously hard to do them. Uh, these absorption assays for pillow stages. Um, so we're trying to figure that out. Uh, we're also just trying to do some binding assays. Um, but based on where FEMU is, I don't think it's blocking this ride. Because the other phages can get in the way. So we go now for the next talk by Michael Chapman. He will talk about the reverse cell reception interactions 
So as we get started, uh, thank you to the uh, team at uh, uh, York for organizing this, uh, bringing us all together. The subtitle of this talk could be, I thought we knew uh, what was going on. Uh, and I want to give you an update since uh, uh, we were last together in Brainerd, and we're working with um, AAD, a very simple uh, virus, and doesn't cause disease. The main interest is as a vector for uh, in vivo gene therapy. And we hope that structure will help address a number of uh, problems that we'll get to later in the, the uh, talk that we hope to be able to improve upon through uh, some rational engineering. Uh, so my start in this work came uh, from X-ray crystallography. About 15 years ago now, we moved pretty much exclusively to electron microscopy, but we have to incorporate a number of other methods, as you will see. Uh, now, we're going to be talking about cellular entry, and the conventional wisdom until recently was that the primary receptor was one of several different uh, gly extracellular glycans, and uh, we started to get a bit skeptical of this starting about 15 years ago when we were starting to see when we compared our own data with that of Mavis Dacobanje that the interactions of these glycans with uh, uh, the virus were much less specific than we expected for a classical uh, receptor. And so then our attention turned to the several co-receptors, protein, membrane proteins that have been associated with endocytic entry. And we invested several years of work in trying to characterize them further and uh, got skeptical that they were really involved to the extent that was reported. So uh, at this point, my lab made a big shift towards genome-wide searching for host factors that were relevant to cellular entry. And uh, AAD is non-cytopathic, and so first we needed to develop a selection method. Nancy did that by creating fluorescence uh, vectors, and so we were infecting human cells and then sorting them based upon that fluorescence as an indicator of whether the cells were getting infected or not. Now, in about 2013, I chanced upon the work of Jan Koret, working with Ebola and influenza. And as part of his work, he had developed a human haploid knockout library, and uh, we combined uh, uh, his approach and ours to do a, a genome-wide uh, uh, screening for factors that were involved in AAV cell entry, the most significant of which was an uncharacterized transmembrane protein that we uh, labeled AVR, for uh, AAV receptor. Uh, this has now been confirmed. Since Brainard, it's been confirmed by several different groups now using the, the new technology, CRISPR, libraries, etc. So two groups have done it by that, and, and uh, we also have transgenic mouse models that confirm that this is a, a really important uh, cellular entry uh, uh, molecule. And so the, the, the knowledge of how AAD gets into cells has changed uh, quite dramatically, and we now think of the glycans as being, uh, quote, mere attachment uh, factors anchoring the, the virus, and it's really AVR that gets the, the virus in through endocytotic entry. The screen revealed a number of other membrane proteins that were involved in the trafficking of AV uh, towards the nucleus. Uh, so, uh, this was where we were at a brain uh, uh, and we had just solved the structure, the highest resolution structure that we obtained was with, uh, with two domains out of the extracellular uh, part of the receptor, PKD1 and PKD2, 
and we got to see on the outside of AAV2, the PKB2 domain, um, at about two and a half angstrom uh, resolution. So this is where we were at, um, at Bernard. And uh, along the way, we had a bit of a surprise because in localizing which domains were important for the viral entry, which domains of the receptor were important, uh, we had struck upon a difference between different serotypes of, of AAV. And we were so surprised by this that we and our collaborators approached this with three completely different methods, all of which led to the same conclusion. So AAV2, it's PKD domain 2 that's critical, with PKD1 playing an accessory role. But when we switch serotype to AAV5, PKD2 doesn't do anything, apparently. It's all dependent upon PKD1. And so we then uh, looked at the, the structure of uh, now the receptor bound to AAV5, and now this is PKD1, a different domain that we see bound strongly to the virus. And we'll see in a minute, it's in a completely different position. Uh, we're in no doubt that we've got the position right. This shows the, the map at the interface. You can see both receptor and virus. It's very clear uh, uh, to interpret. So now if we compare uh, the two states, it turns out that AAV2 is a representative of, of the major family of AAVs. Other groups have now solved structures of complex with AAV1 and AAV8, and they all look like AAV2. Now, AAV5 is a bit of a loner in the phylogenetic tree. We had to hunt a bit further for a virus that would be similar, and this is the, the GOAT um, AAV over here. And you can see that the receptor is bound in, in a very similar way. So we've got now two families of the way the same receptor is being bound to different stereotypes um, of AAV. Uh, there's actually a third family, and this is the group of AAV4-like viruses that don't appear to bind this receptor at all. It has loops that conflict with the binding site of, in this configuration or in this configuration. Through molecular genetic simulation, we, we've learned that these loops can be moved, but the energy to do that makes the binding very unfavorable. So, a reminder of what we're learning here. We have AVR that's got multiple domains, uh, different domains are being bound at different sites on the virus. And so, one of the things that I thought was, well, maybe our experiments aren't very good. Maybe this receptor actually binds both domains, but one of them is weak, and we're not seeing it by electron microscopy. So, we then turned to uh, bioelectron tomography to try to hunt down a more mobile yeah, missing domain. And so uh, this is AAV2 here, and so it's the PKD1 domain that we're missing, that we see by cryo-ET in one of several different configurations. It's pointing away from the virus. On the right, this is AAV5. PKD1 is bound strongly. We're looking for PKD2. Again, several different configurations pointing away from the virus. So we still haven't solved our mystery. And that is with AAV2, how come uh, uh, PKD1, as well as PKD2, is apparently important for binding and transduction? We're not seeing any interaction with the virus. Well, we have just the tiniest of hints. Maybe. Uh, I think we're stuck. Clearly, they want me to shut up. Oh, here we go. Uh, uh, so, uh, we're now returning to AV5, not AV2. And now we're looking at the, the single particle cryo-EM. 
this is how we would usually look at it. I mean, we would usually look at a high contour where we see well resolved the different strands of the beta barrel. Now we're going to go down in the weeds, lowering and lowering the contour level. And what we find that we see is an extra hairpin of, of mass, two extra strands. We don't know what this protein is because we're not resolving the side chains. It's a bit of a mystery. What we, we propose with Cardinal uh, data is that what we might actually have is a dynamic organization of the receptor and that possibly we're seeing one subunit that's bound strongly, um, but there is on occasion or always, we don't know, um, a second subunit that comes into the picture and we're just occasionally capturing, if you like, um, a couple of strands of that neighboring subunit. But really, we, we don't know um, what's going on. That's a, a mystery to be solved. So now I want to move to more solid ground, and that's uh, antibodies binding and neutralization. I showed this at, at Brainard, and this is comparing the binding of PKD2 to AV2 with a prior structure of a neutralizing antibody, A20, found. And you'll see that there's conflict. This surprised us because the literature had defined the mechanism of neutralization of this antibody as being post-entry. And here we see pretty clearly that there would be interference between the antibody and the binding to receptor. So remember that we've got another class of AVs that now bind receptor in a different way. And so we went to look at the same type of thing um, in AV5. Now, we did this experimentally. These are competition ELISA assays. And what we're looking at here is adding increasing amounts of neutralizing um, antibody and finding that we're inhibiting the, the binding of receptor. We're doing it experimentally rather than superimposing structures. Structures with complexes of both of these antibodies have been determined, but the, the structures were never deposited to the PDB or the EMDB, and so we don't have a way of, of now comparing exactly to, to where the receptor is binding. But what we can do is take the lists of, of epitope residues, those that, that the authors defined as being contact residues, color them, and we see that they're directly underneath where the receptor is being bound. So we would assume that they're interfering in both of these cases. Uh, and these are additional cases where the, uh, by the, the neutralization mechanism um, was thought to be post-entry. Uh, there are actually a dozen uh, structures um, that of complexes that haven't been uh, deposited. We can look at them in the same type of way, you know, coloring the, the binding areas and comparing that with where we've been receptor being bound. And in most of these cases, not quite all, but in most of these cases, we see that the antibodies bound to the surface would be interfering with the uh, uh, receptor binding. Now, Perhaps this is not too surprising. This is a fairly common way that uh, uh, viruses are neutralized by antibodies. Um, but it was not the way that was thought to occur for the AAD. And it's really important because one of the things that we're going to have to address in gene therapy is the immunogenicity of, of these vectors. And we're going to have to play with, with AAD capsids to, to interfere uh, uh, with antibody binding, and now we're learning that the, the uh, major regions that have been recognized by neutralizing antibodies are the, the receptor binding regions. We're going to have to do this in a smart way that avoids interfering with the cellular entry. So that brings me full circle uh, back to the, uh, you know, why we're doing all of this, and, and uh, that this is motivated by uh, gene therapy, and there have been some tremendous advances in the last few years. So, you know, since uh, the conference in, in Brain Art, there's been a, a new treatment for uh, spinal muscular atrophy that's been uh, approved by the FDA, and this has been a really debilitating 
uh, disease. The, uh, one in 10,000 live births suffer from SMA1, and the prognosis for children is awful. Uh, survival two to six years. And so this gene therapy, I'm, the, the kids, the, there's a, a, a variation in how well they do. But a typical child now is, is surviving through, um, you know, as long as we know at this point, uh, disabled, but uh, uh, substantially functioning. Uh, and then just recently, a therapy came out for hemophilia B. Um, now, there are still challenges that we hope to be able to, to influence. The, the gene therapy treatments that we're seeing now are the low-hanging fruit, the easy pickings, because you need very low um, levels of the transgene being expressed in, in your patient for success in all of the cases so far. There are many other serious genetic diseases where you need much higher expression levels. And here, the horrible inefficiency of viral entry by AAV um, really kills you or kills patients. Um, what's happening is that these viruses are immunogenic, and as the pharmaceutical companies crank up the doses to treat these other cases, they're running into immunohepatotoxicity, and patients are dying in, in clinical trials. And so this is right now a really fine balance in terms of, of doing gene therapy, and we hope that uh, knowledge of structure will help us uh, be able to do this more efficiently. And so, uh, you know, what, one is a plea. I, I know we, we've got a shortage of, of postdocs throughout the community, but if you want to do, you know, tough structural biology with a direct uh, impact upon clinical outcomes, uh, 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 speak to me soon. We, we've got lots of openings if you would like to uh, participate in this. Please spread the word. Uh, but and part of that is graduation of, of some of the people that have been involved uh, with this work. I've highlighted in yellow the people that contributed most to what I've spoken about. Uh, Mark Silveria worked on AD5, uh, Ed Large on uh, GOAT AD, Grant Zane on AD4, and uh, Gucci Hu from Scott Stags, our group, gave us a lot of help doing the, the tomography. So, uh, thank you. Fantastic talk. Thank you so much. My question is, you have these three classes, A, B, five, and then the other two. Are they correlated with totalism? Because they're different totalism, right? So is this correlating? Uh, tropism. Uh, they do like different cells. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel inclined to take the first step. Uh, uh, so, so for you, those of you who are uh, not American, uh, the, the Fifth Amendment, you, you don't have to incriminate yourself in court, right? Uh, uh, so uh, th there's a lot of published data on tropisms of, of AAV and particular interest in, in uh, neurotropic uh, vectors, AAV8 and AAV9, etc. We do not find a correlation. Um, you know, in, in private, no one's going to talk anyway. Uh, uh, we, we've got to be very careful, I think, of some of the tropism data. The, 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 the differences are usually within single order of magnitude, but they're, they're fairly subtle, and there are lots of drivers of this, particularly uh, IT, and lots of people who want to claim that they have the magic bullet to... Uh, to deliver back to, to where you want. So I, I think we've got to read this literature with a bit of skepticism. Yeah, yeah my, my question is actually a bit, bit vague. So uh, how much do we actually know about the receptor itself? Like, if the, if the protein is named that being a receptor, it's like, yes, not that much. But uh, do you think that the, like, the different domains or the, um, the different domains acting as receptors, do they detect some functional differences? I mean, is there maybe variation from cell by the cell by the mouse? This is the edge. Yeah, well, um, we, we don't really know. So, uh, Jan Kerr, our collaborator in, in uh, identifying the receptor, has, you know, part of his lab is now working on what the native function is for uh, AVR. 
it's been characterized, uh, we assume that it's uh, an orphan receptor that we don't know the, the natural ligand for. Uh, but the other interesting thing about it is, is that it cycles. And so uh, it's only on the cell surface, transiently. And uh, uh, so the virus has evolved, it, it's learned, if you like, to, to uh, bind at the surface and be pulled through endospectosis towards the, the nucleus. And it, it's key for, uh, for the cellular trafficking of the, the virus inward. Uh, not, not that we know. Uh, this is highly conserved. Um, I mean, so some of the most interesting stuff is, is doing experimental splicing. Uh, uh, and so, Yan and, and we have been doing a bit of that. Yeah, we, we tried that for a, a few years, uh, and um, yeah, our, our approach, with, which uh, I've been talking about it because it wasn't very successful, uh, uh, was to um, uh, you know, create vectors in a hypermutating uh, environment and uh, do selection of that type. We, we didn't make a whole lot of progress. Uh, um, yeah, our view at the moment is that our priority should be to, to work with, with polyclonal uh, antibodies uh, because I think right now the, the complete picture is, is monoclonal from what's going on there. And we really want to first be looking at polyclonal human serum and things like this. So let's thank uh, Michael again. <laughs> All this, uh, again, thanks all to all the speakers, and uh, that's my micro-look at all speakers. Thanks for the interaction.